<laughs> How's everybody doing? Good? All right. Um, here we go. All right. So if you build it, will they come? I'm titling my talk that, and also, you know, thinking about how human-centered design principles can direct our products. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree in human development and also visual arts, and since then I also got, um, I moved here from sunny California to Chicago, although outside right now it seems pretty logical for me to have done that. <laughs> um, but uh, I, through my master's research, I also researched um, human-centered design and how they affect organizations from nonprofits to hybrid organizations to even major corporations. And so um, there has been a huge sort of like slew of journeys that I've also been on since studying those things, applying them to my day-to-day um, -day job and for actually getting paid to do this as well. So it's like you, you run into those situations and I'd like to kind of like bring some of those thoughts here. Um, and like Derek had said, um, we live in a build first world, right? Like everyone's always really ready to put something out there, see how it reacts. And, you know, but the question really is, are we building for human needs, right? A lot of times we think about these ideas and we put them out there and then afterwards we say, oh, I guess that was the wrong idea. And then we learn to take a step backwards. And I'm actually really happy to hear all the UX designers in here and all of the researchers and everybody in here, even you know the d engineers that exist in here. I'm sure by now you've heard of UX and either they've pestered you about something already. <laughs> but um, this is where we're going, right? I think five years ago, um, if I would have, have asked anybody in this room who knows of IDEO, it would have still been kind of like a, oh, yeah, I've heard about them. They kind of do some like innovation research, um, human-centered design, but they are kind of the ambassadors to make this idea um, sort of labeled, first of all, and um, marketed towards people to so, sort of digest it in a feasible manner. Um, human-centered design is really just problem solving, right? And we're problem solving for people um, and finding those problems initially. Um, this is a really chaotic sort of journey and methodology, but theoretically this is what happens, right? You find your problem, you research in your data collection, you organize data and find themes, you transform things into insights, transforming insights into design opportunities, brainstorming, designing, prototyping and experimenting, and then finally delivery, right? But it doesn't necessarily even stop there. It kind of cycles on and on and on. As humans, as we change as well, um, even from last year, the condition that we were in, as opposed to this year, things are very different, right? Even in our environments, um, even in the past week, our weather is so weird, you know? Like, how do we adjust to those things? Um, so this is an image of probably something that you see online all the time <laughs> when people bring in this idea of human-centered design. There's a lot of post-its and it's always like, oh my god, why are they so fluorescent? And they're just like staring at me all the time, you know? And it doesn't make you nervous, right? Um, I know for sure, in, even in our office, you know, engineers have come up to our team and been like, why do you guys have to put that up there all the time, right? And it's just a, actually like a really fascinating journey for us in our um, organization as well. But I did want to kind of actually call out this idea of a post-it, and I'll kind of return back to this in terms of paper. But um, every single one of these post-its have a data piece of a human and what they have said in our interviews. And the physical presence of them actually helps the human-centered design process fully work out in that end-to-end -end manner where there's so much information that we sort of intake, right? And to be able to translate those things into a feasible solution that could potentially help at its most, um, at impacting its, at its highest potential, this is kind of a way where we condition ourselves to not necessarily just stuff all of our data onto an Excel sheet or lots of just, you know, computer things, but literally put them on the wall and say, this is what the human said. And as we cluster things together, how are we perceiving these things to have 
more of an impact not only on us, but how do we see patterns in that behavior as well? Um, I wanted to bring this slide up for humans because not only is she adorable, but a lot of times, you know, like we think about research and we think about this idea of, oh yeah, like we should do user research or UX has to do with people, you know? But at the end of the day, you know, I think a lot of us are actually afraid of humans. Um, <laughs> and I actually have this beautiful story from even the past couple of weeks where I've been training two of our engineers in-house to follow the human-centered design method. And within one of our client projects, um, we built a research sort of scenario to go out into our city and to ask people about certain research questions. And the morning of that we were going out, um, one, of my, one of the developers that was with me, he looked at me and he was like, I don't think I can be a designer and I don't think I can do this, even though he's shown interest for years. And he was like, I'm so nervous and I can't, I don't think I'm gonna be able to talk to them. <laughs> um, and I looked at him and I said, I don't think anybody wants to do this. <laughs> it's so hard, right? Like, but the beauty of it is, though, is that most of us, um, at least if you're like me, I'm an introvert that is extremely curious about what people have to say, but I don't necessarily know like how to engage with it, and I'm really fascinated with humans and, and all of the above, you know? And the beautiful part of it was that he came back and um, after his first couple of interviews and he was like, that's actually not that bad. And I learned something really important about myself or important to me that I actually am interested in people. I'm not sick of them all the time. And if there is a purpose to what I'm asking them um, questions about, then it's super fascinating. Um, that day, this is actually a, a photo of one of the interviews that we did conduct. Um, this is for a project that we're working on where there's like a calendar application for this client and they were really curious how people use calendars. And we approached somebody in the cafe and the beautiful just sort of universe showed up and said he was going to sketch to us what his calendar looked like and how he kept his calendar, which is currently on a whiteboard. Um, so talk about this beautiful story, right, where we're assuming from the client side that everybody uses digital calendars. And we walk into this space and he tells us, I don't use that at all. I use a whiteboard and this is what it looks like. And we come back and we think about these things and these ideas that we had originally and it's just totally thrown out the window. And it's a really good um, way for us to not only connect with our community, but to really understand what's actually happening and when we are just around so many tech people as well, we sort of use the same things in the same way. So learning more about people in that general fashion is um, just super important and it's actually just really fun. <laughs> Um, so things to consider, right? This is a really broad topic and there's no way that I'm going to actually walk through from beginning to end what every like human-centered concept can contribute to what you do. Um, but I do have a few things that I wanted to go through as maybe takeaways from this, especially when we're focusing on the digital sphere. And I have a few examples at the end that I will kind of like tie this into. But um, one of them is use paper. Right? I know that we are all um, focused in on um, our laptops and the way that we can efficiently open source things, but actually, when you're thinking about your product, paper isn't evil, by the way. You can recycle it, too. Um, there's a component that happens um, where something physical shows up in your hand and you begin to understand it in a very, very different way. So if anything, um, just get your hands onto a sketch Right? Um, raise your hand if you think you cannot sketch. I promise you, you can. Like, I, I, I've, I've, I promise you, just put your pen onto a paper and it's magical things will happen and be brave, all right? Um, there is this question in research that I run into all the time, right? We think about research as in like, oh, we'll just go ask a bunch of people a bunch of questions, and then whatever we ask them, those will drive our product needs, and then we have statistics. Um, let's decipher that, yeah, that's a great idea. 
you know, um, does anybody of you have like a, a side app idea that you kind of talk to people about? No? I do. And I, those things come into my mind all the time. And when you talk to somebody, which is usually your friend or family member, right, they're going to they're gonna say, yeah, that's great. You should build it, right? Um, there's this moment when you ask research questions, and a lot of times you ask them and phrase them in a way where, um, would you want something like this? You know, tell me, tell me about what you want. Um, tell me about you know, this, this idea of want versus tell me more, right? There's a shift that should happen in that phrasing. And as you um, really re ask these research questions, digging in deeper and always asking, tell me a little bit more about that, and taking a step back and deciphering what people are saying in order to find that sweet spot of what, actually, what people actually need um, is a really beautiful part about human-centered design too, where um, you're observing mostly uh, and at the same time, really digging into those ideas. Um, visceral reactions are crucial. And I know that designers get sometimes like a bad rep about, about oh, you just want to make it pretty, you know, um, you just want to make it look good, right? But actually, there's a lot of truth to what happens when somebody looks at something. Um, I don't know anybody who would want to eat like a super messy plate. Is that something that people are interested in? You know, when you go to a restaurant and you expect good service, um, you also expect the plate to be to look good and to be appetizing, right? It's sort of the same idea. Um, this example by Philip Stark. Do you guys? Any, has anybody seen this before? Yeah. There's something about this that's like beautiful, but so creepy, right? And there's a moment to consider where you need to put effort into putting it into making it look and feel right, right? A lot of this feel component gets lost in the mix, and this is where a lot of like art direction can come in, especially from our advertising folks that have been involved in this for a very long time. But this is extremely crucial to showing somebody what you build, right? Like when you build something and you show it to them and you're like, it's pretty cool, huh? You know, like even if you have done all of the, the right things and found the right thing to build, um, if they are not initially accepting of it, um, they're not going to look beyond that, okay? I actually have this really hilarious story about my sister who had no idea what Uber was. She was in high school, and of course, that's not really something that she should know. Um, and I, once I figured out that she uh, didn't know what Uber was, this was a few years ago, I immediately started to record her because I wanted to know what she had to say. So I showed her the website and I told her about the concept and she was like, initially she was like, what? You're going to have like people just pick you up? That's weird, you know? And once she saw what was going on, she was like, well, it kind of looks legit. I would do it, right? Like in a few seconds, she just completely turned that around. And there's something really beautiful about that though. And a lot of effort that you can say has value, right? Um, I say use your environment. A lot, of, a lot of us look outside and beyond like what we can do um, globally, you know, um, even nationally, um, even like let's take it to like the whole city of Chicago, right? It can get smaller and smaller, but if you find what's being used around you and see what you can make from that, that's also an, a, a really good way to figure out that you're on the right track. If you're reaching too far to find data sources that are like not local at all, for instance, or if you're finding material that's just you know not helpful in the region that you live in, it's a very clear indicator that it's not going to be accepted accepted from the people around you, right? There's like an environmental piece to this that's really crucial. Um, consider the culture and manners. Um, this can get really, really sort of subtle in that way, but um, my interac interactions designers in the room, um, interactions should be driven by social rules, right? Um, a lot of us can get into like, oh, it would be so cool if it like spinned around and then it did this. But are there additional ways that we're creating experiences to respect the boundaries that people have and also um, driving in the culture of humans around us. One example of this that actually we ideated today 
and for our client was how do we get an app notification and email to arrive appropriately? You know, thinking about what happens when you introduce yourself to someone, you know? Uh, if I introduce myself to you and then ask for your email and then immediately sent you an email while I was talking to you, that's pretty rude, right? And thinking about this idea that, hey, if I met with you, I engaged with you, told you about what I, what I am and what I'm all about and asked you about the same, um, a lot of our client engagement people in here, we all know that it takes about a day or even two days to send that email to reiterate the fact that, oh, it was nice to meet you, right? So that's like a very human-mannered thing that we can even translate into, do you want a push notification? You know, go back to settings. There's like these small ways that we can do that. Um, have purpose. Uh, I don't think I can. I don't think I need to reiterate this in this room, where it seems like everyone here is very passionate about our city and just civic tech in general. But um, you know, consider why you're building what you're building. You know, um, and this part is actually a huge piece of the human-centered design process, where uh, you bring people along. And this might seem really simple, but this is actually the hardest part towards the methodology of human-centered design. When you think about your product and you think about all the people that could be affected by this product idea, uh, bringing them along towards your product and your vision for it, um, you're already like 70% there for them to accept that piece of it, you know? And getting their input and social buy-in, right, is gonna be really key for the success of your product. Uh, I wanted to bring this to the screen. Does anybody, has anybody seen this before? No? Um, it's quite old and <laughs> it's about 10 years old actually. I can't believe it's that old. But this is a, um, an art piece actually that was then acquired by MoMA. It's a video. But it's a, two professors, um, Anthony Dunn and Fiona Rady, created this thing called the Technological Dream Series, number one. And I'm just going to walk you through this because this is really important and why, um, at least for me, I have this passion around bringing human-centered designs toward, toward the human-centered design methodology towards tech because this is like a dystopian future, right? And I'm going to just draw your attention toward these four objects right here. Um, the concept is, is that this, yeah, this red ring, right, is called robot number one. And based off of um, just how technology has evolved without us contributing towards protecting it, it's very independent. It just sort of lives on its own. You can hang out with it. It's almost like a collection of all of your data from the past, like, you know, however many years. Um, you hang out with it, but it does its own thing. Um, robot number two, which is the image over on the very right, she's looking into its eyes. And it's a very, very nervous robot. And what we see from that, actually, is that um, it's, a, it's a security measure. Um, how many of us are into, or talk about security a lot? I'm sure in civic tech is like a huge, right? Um, thinking about our data that's out there, right? This robot here protects all of our data. And because it's so nervous about all of the things that could happen with your data, it requires you to look into its eyes for five minutes before it even gives you access to anything you own, right? And you're like, okay, how is this even being relevant? But just to speak, just to kind of like speed this up, the middle one where she's, look, where she's hearing down at it, it's very needy. Um, the one with the speakerphone is um, extremely sort of like nervous as well and kind of like, like disrupts um, any sort of interaction that you come into it. And what this is actually saying though is that, that if we don't protect the, the products that we make right now, um, it could evolve into something dangerous like this, you know? And if we don't begin to include our social habits, our social um, boundaries within technology, um, this could happen. I wanted to kind of close with this um, image. I know it's not a technology-focused um, image, but it 
utilized um, the human-centered design process from the full spectrum. Um, there were some students who went to Nepal from uh, the D school, and they decided to not just go in there, even though they heard about a few kind of things that they could solve for within the health community there. They went and they interviewed and they observed and they investigated and they used this entire methodology and realized that the biggest problem that they were seeing and um, grappling with was the death of infants and the fact that incubators that are mostly made in, and sold in the U.S. were hundreds, and thousands of, hundreds of thousands of dollars and they couldn't get their hands on them. And the more they researched into why these infants were passing away, it was the fact that they were just too cold, right? The more and more that they began to hear all the mothers and nurses and doctors talk about it, they realized that these babies are just too cold. And so this little effort of creating a small prototype, and this is kind of like version three already, but creating a small little sleeping bag for um, the babies that were also sourced from materials around them. Um, this is now saving like hundreds of babies every day just by keeping them warm. And it's like this idea of coming into a situation as well to think about um, what things can I help with? How can I empathize? So that's it. This is my email. <laughs> So well, we'll do Q and oh, on. we'll do Q and A, um, and we'll run this microphone around. So um, go ahead and put your hands up. You can do you want to? You can run and pick whoever you want to answer the questions, and then Christopher, you can run around with Mike. So here we go. Thank you. Hi. So a quick question for you: How do you? I think human-centered design is a really cool idea for building new products, but what do you do if you feel like you have kind of a half-baked product or a half-baked idea and you want to see and you want to shape it towards human-centered design? So how do you apply it to something that's kind of been partially built? Sure. Um, we run into that situation a lot, actually, at DevMind, where people will bring their version 1.0 product and try to figure out how they can improve it. Um, definitely a heuristic analysis of trying to figure out um, the 10 points in which uh, a product can be determined to be close, closely related to humans. Does, any, does everybody know the heuristic analysis process? Um, there are 10, um, 10 principles that you can look for um, based on Nielsen's uh, principles. And there are ways to sort of determine and measure how closely um, you are relating your product to people. Um, definitely that, that's a very scientific research approach about it. Um, putting it in front of humans and testing it in a usability manner, um, absolutely. That, you know, I think that that's really, really important. There's so many things that even in a small um, idea, right, that we can assume and just seeing people operate in that space just without even telling them what they should be looking for. Um, is a really great learning experience. And um, what else? I think that's it. I would definitely start with that. The heuristic analysis is actually a really powerful thing. Um, if, you, if you know about it, we can, uh, I can pull up the 10 principles, but um, we actually did a heuristic analysis for a client recently and determined all of the different ways why their product was honestly wrong <laughs> and just like just built incorrectly. Not necessarily that like um, the idea, I mean in, the idea in some ways was still wrong, but <laughs> um, but it's, a, it's actually a really good sort of like doctor's note, like are you, like do you have a headache? Um, do you have the sniffles? You know, like those kinds of principles that you can measure your product on. I would encourage you to do that. Uh, other questions? How do you know when you've interacted with enough humans and for... <laughs> Beep boop. Uh, and 
And for, for what projects and problems do you need to talk to more people and for what do you need fewer opinions on? That is the hardest question that I even have to answer all the time, honestly. Like, we think about these pilots and micropilot. Have you, has anybody heard of micropiloting here? Um, it's also like a new prototyping way that um, we're investigating service design sort of things. Um, I say, you know, when you feel like the population set that you have uh, targeted um, is fully represented, um, and we're talking about gender, age range, um, job responsibilities, right? When you feel like you've dug in deep into uh, a good representation of those people, I would say that is a good time to stop. Um, I think that anybody can research forever, just like the way that you can design forever, and so giving yourself actually a timeline um, really helps uh, that process in order to even choose the people that you're going to talk to and also to kind of just call it and say, you know what, we're done. And um, if something happens down the line where you do see your product sort of swaying somewhere else, um, then going back into that usability piece to bring those people that you're now thinking that you didn't account for, you know, quickly doing that is probably the best way to go about that. Uh, next question. I'm kind of curious um, if you have any general sense about what are like common pitfalls that were like or maybe early warning signs when you maybe hear a certain like or, you know, your clients were uh, saying that they want to do X, Y, or Z that you know that they're going down kind of like a wrong path. Are there some like early warning signs that you could think of that would be generally useful for folks? Yeah, um, when you hear people talk about their stakeholders <laughs> all the time, that's a huge red flag, right? Like, because when they're talking about like their boss that says this needs to happen, that that's a really big like moment where you need to say, okay, let's bring that boss into this room right now. Um, we actually, <laughs> I know that sounds really harsh, but. It is really a huge red flag that we run into all the time where let's say a product um, team is like moving about a product a certain way and they want us to execute a certain piece of it. Um, we recently went into uh, a situation where, yeah, the boss then entered the room and he was like, this isn't what I want, you know? And that's something that we, you need to really analyze um, from even an organizational perspective. So. Um, you meet your client team, and but take a step back, analyze what's actually the organizational structure, and this is actually even more important for nonprofit structures too, because the hierarchy is so strong. Um, but to bring that democratic piece as f as strongly as you can to bring people in the same room at the same time is, um, I would say, that that's usually the biggest red flag that I run into. <laughs> Um, other red flags too though is like um, designers who then just kind of, we, it's really easy to like fall in love with a design as well and um, it's hard to fall out of love with certain designs too. Um, but if you do hear a designer as well just talk about like, oh but it would be so cool, right? <laughs> like there's nothing cool that should be created for cool sake ever, <laughs> ever, right? That's another piece of it. Um, also, when engineers come in and they're like, uh, that will, that can't happen. And they just like, can't explain that to you. Um, and even when they can explain it to you, but there's like, kind of like that anxiety piece that comes into that conversation. Um, just kind of taking a step back and being like, okay, well, can you just tell me like how long that will take? We can work with it. And just easing that emotional tension. I say that that's kind of, those are kind of like the three big things that we look out for. <laughs> Other questions? Oh. I guess, do you, do you ever find yourself running into an issue where you know, you're working with a client and you know the humans are the problem? So, you know, it, Henry Ford supposedly said, you know, if you ask people what they wanted, they'd want a faster horse. So, in when you do you do, uh, deal with clients that have kind of I don't want to say revolutionary products, but very uh, different products that people may be reluctant to adopt right away. 
and and because the technology is advanced or, or beyond what's common I mean do you do you run into problems like that frequently or yeah how do you, how do you we run into them? that those problems all the time um, a lot of it is uh, the unwillingness to kind of um, to try um, something new um, Actually, I'm going to share this one story because I still don't know what to do with it, right? Because I, uh, I was speaking to some service designers in the healthcare community, and they were talking about the specific um, design that would really help um, long-term patients just feel emotionally better um, about their surroundings while they're in the hospital for that long. Um, and the doctor looked at them and said, well, I keep them alive. Like, what, what do you do about that? And I don't know, I, I still can't kind of like wrap my head around that, except the fact that there's obviously psychology majors in here that say there are so many things wrong with that interior design of hospitals. Um, but I hope that's not a tangent. But um, yeah, we do run into those situations all the time where clients, um, especially, you know, product managers sometimes who, um, have uh, a really difficult time accepting um, like the behaviors and patterns of the target population that they're so sure about. Um, yeah. Did you want an answer as to like what we do with those people? <laughs> or yeah. Right. Yeah. The best, I think the best way that um, anybody sort of argues with that is benchmarks. Um, and I think in any industry, uh, you have people who say that won't happen to something. Um, I'm having a hard time kind of like thinking of an example right now. But um, using examples from that particular person's perspective or generation to translate perhaps the innovative like uh, wave that happened during that time and really connecting it to the environment and the things that are happening currently that parallels that example i think that's always been really helpful um, for us to argue the point that um, that needs to be considered it's tough but um, like really connecting to the human, and like really empathizing with the client too, um, has been helpful for us to kind of convince them that this is the process of, and the direction that they need to go. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks.